Mike is someone I knew personally, uh, as did you. And, um, you know, I came to regard him as a friend. But before he was a friend, he was a hero to me. I think about it now, uh, like our late colleague, Ira Gittler, passed recently, fairly recently, a couple of years ago. You know, he was 90 when he passed, and he was on 52nd Street. He saw Bird and Monk, all those cats, did recordings, you know, did the sessions with them, hung with them. And us looking at him, we're sort of jealous, thinking that, oh, he, he was around when giants walked the earth. And now, as I'm doing uh, Zoom talks with students at Berkeley and the University of Cincinnati, other places, these students are 1920. They regard me as I regarded Ira, like Michael Brecker, Jocko, these, these were giants who walked the earth. And I hung with them, I was pals with them. And uh, so my motivation for writing this book about Mike was twofold, to pay tribute to his genius as an incredible musician, an influential musician, uh, a transcendent musician, a, a, a transitional figure in the music and a heartfelt uh, love letter to this cat who I came to know very well and uh, spoke to a lot on the phone and uh, shared a sense of humor with him. And uh, as you know, somebody, for somebody to be so profoundly influential and virtuosic on his instrument, and be so humble is incredible. Jocko, of course, was the very opposite. He came to New York from Florida saying he was the greatest bass player in the world. He walked up to Ron Carter and said that as a means of introduction. You know, Mike was humble all the way through his career in spite of how many multitudes he influenced with his really revolutionary prowess on the instrument, of course, he himself inspired by train and carrying that on and putting it into different venues uh, and uh, expressions. But yeah, I felt that uh, a book on Mike would touch on, would, would really address those two issues for me personally. Him being this awesome figure in music and also this warm human being, family man, husband, father, who uh, had a sad and beautiful life. And uh, I wanted to document that sort of uh, sad and beautiful tale. because of our lives in the music, are the relationships with these musicians. Some of them become close friends, others acquaintances, some are uh, sometimes the subject of conflict. Right. Um, how do you feel that knowing Michael as you did benefited you in terms of writing the book? I was privy to several recording sessions 
where I got to see his process, sort of uh, behind the scenes, look at his process, and uh, rather than the finished product on stage. And through that, I came to appreciate his real single-minded determination at pushing himself to excellence. Like for instance, in the studio one time, I remember him, it was a, it was a session. It was not his session, somebody else's. I think he was the singer, Mark, Mark Theato. I can't remember. It was just a session he was gonna play a solo over existing tracks. He played the first track and it was mind blowing. And he's like, oh, that sucks. I can do another one. Did the next one, it was mind blowing as well. Very different, equally mind blowing. He went through like 10 tracks. And then uh, of course he left the dilemma for the producer to try to figure out which among all these gems he was gonna choose. Uh, but that kind of self-effacing attitude Mike had is something that uh, I didn't know about, you know, before I had got to know him. Uh, and uh, also the sense of humor is not something that would necessarily come out on stage. The very dry, very witty, kind of pun-oriented uh, humor, occasionally lapsing into uh, a Yiddish stick of Mickey Katz and, uh, you know, <laughs> he was... He was hilarious. He made me laugh a lot. And uh, I guess understanding his humanity made me better understand his musical expression and appreciate it uh, in, in a fuller sense. As a writer, I have written a couple of books and written other things, and it's an undertake. This is a serious undertaking. You've done this with Jocko. You've done this with Michael. Uh, you know, my favorite writer, Ben Hecht, once said, "Oh, writing is, writing is easy. Just open a vein." Uh, so, what, what was your process, and how long did it take from you decided to do the book to actually it being published? Okay, so. I engaged a publisher through my agent. It was actually somebody that I had previously worked with, Backbeat Books. I engaged them in January of 2019. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a sure thing that they were gonna go for it. Uh, the ensuing months involved the process of going through the contract, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't really get the green light until uh, end of April of 2019. And so I began the process of interviewing in May of 2019. The very first interview I did, uh, and I ended up doing over 100, the first guy I interviewed was Steve Kahn. Went up to his place on the Upper West Side. Steve, of course, had played in the Brecker Brothers. And, uh, you know, had his own records on Columbia that Mike and Randy and essentially the Brecker Brothers crew played on uh, through the 70s and into the 80s. So I started with him. He's a friend and I also know that he is something of a scholar himself about music and has a very thorough website where he collects and dissects uh, music, including a lot of compositions by Mike. I knew he had a love of Mike and I wanted to start there. So I come to his place and the very first thing we did before he would answer any questions, he's like, sit down, I want you to hear something. And he put on a, a piece of music that he had edited. It was all, it was a 20 minute piece of Mike music in various contexts, very neatly strewn together, no segues. It was, just uh, very brilliantly cut together. 
And as we sat there, Steve had his eyes closed. It was as if he were meditating. And I could see that Mike was somebody who deeply affected him. And he was just reliving Mike's essence through this music. And that was like a real interesting way to kick off the process for this book. It had a spiritual element to it, which I felt existed in Mike's music in general. But that was literally the very first interview I did. And from there, I carried on. Uh, I should say that at the time I was living in West Hartford, I had moved here a few years ago. Uh, I actually moved here on Halloween day of 2017. So that's coming up on four years ago. So when I would go into the city and jump on a bus, go in, uh, stay at my sister's place up in Inwood for a few days and go around interviewing people in the city. Uh, it started with Steve and it went to Adam Nussbaum and I jumped on another bus and went down to uh, Stroudsburg to interview uh, Pennsylvania, to interview uh, David Liebman and uh, continued uh, uh, Jeff Tane Watts in Easton. Uh, on another trip, I went out to East Hampton to interview Randy. I went up to Hastings on Hudson to interview Susan Brecker and on and on. And that process, continued through that entire year of 2019. Uh, I followed up with a few phone interviews at the beginning of 2020. And then right around the time of the lockdown, that's when I began in earnest to transcribe these interviews and start shaping it into a book. And I ended up turning the manuscript in in late December of 2020. So essentially, I would have been locked down anyway, working on this book eight hours a day through uh, doing the transcriptions and uh, molding it into shape, uh, conceiving the structure of it and uh, putting the puzzle pieces together. Mike's popularity, he was such a beloved figure. He was such a profoundly influential figure. Uh, let me put it in this context. This is what I wrote in the preface of the book. It's just a short paragraph to kick off the preface of uh, this book. He was a generational talent. After John Coltrane, there was no more revered and profoundly influential saxophonist on the planet than Michael Brecker. For those of us coming of age in the 1970s, during that transitional decade when the boundaries between rock and jazz began to blur, Brecker stood as a transcendent figure. He was our train. And uh, I feel that, you know, really, in an absolute sense, uh, I never saw John Coltrane. Mike did. That was a really uh, life-changing moment for him. At the age of 16, he saw Train at uh, Temple University, the very same concert that all these years later, uh, Zev Feldman put out on Resonance Records. You know, and so Train was his North Star, and he was inspired to take up the tenor. He had gone through clarinet and then alto. And seeing John Coltrane, hearing that music, really uh, gave him a mission. And his inspiration, I think, was uh, conveyed to all the people that heard him play over time. Uh, music students, uh, aficionados, and fans alike were really feeling what he was putting down. Thank you.